I remember as a youth pastor being in conversations with young Christian ladies who were terrified <laughs> of the thought that God might ask them to be single. <laughs> it's like, I hope God doesn't call me to be celibate. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that's pretty rare. I think most people will get married and that's the way God made it. So that should be an encouragement to you. <laughs> and uh, But in this chapter, Paul talks about being married or being celibate. Let us read. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of sexual immoralities, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband give his wife the affection owed her and likewise also the wife her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband. Likewise also, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife. Don't deprive one another unless it is by consent for a season that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and may be together again, that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this by way of concession, not a commandment. I wish that all men were like me. However, each man has his own gift from God, one of this kind and another of that kind. But I say to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they don't have self-control, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn. But to the married I command, not I, but the Lord, that the wife not leave her husband. But if she departs, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband not leave his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is content to live with him, let him not leave her. The woman who has an unbelieving husband and he is content to live with her, let her not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbeliever departs, let there be separation. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has distributed to each man, as God has called each, so let him walk. So I command in all the assemblies. Was anyone called having been circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keep keeping of the commandments of God. Let each man stay in that calling in which he was called. Were you called being a bondservant? Don't let that bother you. But if you can get an opportunity to become free, use it. For he who is called in the Lord being a bondservant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who was called being free is Christ's bondservant. You were bought with a price. Don't become bondservants of men. Brothers, let each man in whatever condition he was called stay in that condition with God. Now, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who has obtained mercy from the Lord to be trustworthy. Therefore, I think that because of the distress that is on us, it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be freed. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have oppression in the flesh, and I want to spare you. But I say this, brothers, the time is short, that from now on, both those who have wives may be as though they had none, and those who weep, as though they didn't weep, and those who rejoice, as though they didn't rejoice, and those who buy, as though they didn't possess, and those who use the world, as not using it to the fullest. For the mode of this world passes away, but I desire to have you to be free from cares. He who is unmarried is concerned for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 
but he who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is also a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about how she may please her husband. Oh, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own profit, not that I may ensnare you, but for that which is appropriate, and that you may attend to the Lord without distraction. If any man thinks that he is behaving inappropriately towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of her age, and if need so requires, let him do what he desires. He doesn't sin, let them marry. But he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no urgency, but has power over his own will, and has determined in his own heart to keep his own virgin, does well. So then both he who gives his own virgin in marriage does well, and he who doesn't give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law for as long as her husband lives, but if the husband is dead, she is free to be married to whomever she desires, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she stays as she is, in my judgment, and I think I have God's spirit. So it's a big chapter all about marriage and singleness, and we can hardly cover it all. <laughs> but there are definitely some things worth discussing. In the church at Corinth, sexual immorality was definitely an issue. And we talked a little bit, little bit about that in the last two chapters. And um, however, it seems like there was a wide range of perspectives, including very conservative opinions in the church as well. So someone has written, uh, this chapter starts out by saying, now concerning the things about which you wrote, so when people from Chloe's household came to visit Paul in Ephesus, they came and said lots of things and updated him on the church, and he's addressed the updated stuff, but now he's going to address the things that were written down. So he, previously, he's addressed sexual immorality, so clearly that's going on, but now the question that's written is like seems like the opposite. Someone has asked, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? So, this is the first verse. Concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So he's agreeing with something that they've said, but then he gives a whole heap of context to it. Now, this phrase, to touch a woman, doesn't mean, you know, just, Whoop, I've touched a woman, not that. <laughs> it actually means to have sex with a woman. So it's just, a, it's just an expression of speech that they used in the letter and that Paul used in replying, it's kind of like a nice way of saying what they all knew it meant. He said, however, but, verse two, it, you, it is good. It is good for man not to touch a woman, but because of sexual immoralities, let each man have his own wife. And he goes on to explain that being married is not a sin, that it's there to help people um, avoid temptation, and so in that situation, it's okay to touch a woman as long as it's the one you're married to. <laughs> so it is good to not touch a woman, but if it's your wife, it actually is good to touch her. You can touch your wife um, and a wife can touch her husband. That's all fine. He explains all of that, no problems there. <laughs> in fact, that's even good. He says, however, I wish that all men were like me. Now, what's Paul? He's single and he's celibate. Now, Paul um, quite possibly at some point was previously married. There's a whole big discussion on it. And um, when I did my studies on the book of Corinthians, uh, we, you know, we digged a little bit into this. So it seems like majority of people, scholars think that at one point Paul was married then, of course, the big debate is how did he get unmarried? So they, I guess no one really knows. She could have died. Some people think that when Paul became a Christian, his wife um, rejected him. You know, she was a solidly solid Jewish person sticking to the Jewish way, but he'd left it. There's all these theories. <laughs> In the end, we just don't know. But what we know is that Paul isn't married at this point. He's single, 
And he says, yet I wish that all people were like me. And he goes on to explain that there's benefits to being single as well as benefits to being married. They both have benefits. But he says, if people can't stay single like I am, it's better for them to be married. So it turns out that it's all sorts of different things will happen if you're married that's married to one person and that sex belongs in that marriage. If you're not married, there's no sex and that's being celibate. And Paul, in his opinion, thinks that's better. And because Paul said that, there's um, whole branches of Christianity that have, have kind of clung to this as being the best ideal situation. And so, for example, Catholic priests don't get married. They call it holy orders. You know, when you um, become a priest, you you have to become you stay you become single, stay single. You don't marry. You're devoted to the Lord. And the point that Paul makes is true: that if you're single, you can serve the Lord better. But not everyone is finds it easy to be single. And there are certainly many, many ministers all around the world. The majority, of fact, who are married and do a great job as pastors. Paul found it that it better because he didn't have to worry about um, pleasing a wife and raising children. He could just focus on the Lord. So it worked for Paul. But Paul was given some kind of grace so that the temptations of the world just didn't touch him. And there are many people who are single in service of the Lord, certainly Catholic people I know and others, who've had, who have that grace, like the Lord touches them and so that whole area just isn't even a struggle for them. They just are able to focus on the Lord. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so Paul says that he thinks that's better, except for the fact that God invented marriage. <laughs> God is the one who created marriage. And when God made man and woman in the garden, he said that it was good. He said, he actually said, it's, he said, there was one thing that wasn't good. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will create a helper suitable for him. And he created Eve and she was very good. And he put them together. And the Bible says what God has joined together, let man not separate. So marriage is not only something God has made. God said it's very good. The Bible says God has joined people together in marriage. And when man was single, God said that was not good. <laughs> so you notice how Paul here is saying that these are his opinions. He's saying, it's not I, it's, it's not the Lord, it's I who thinks this. And I feel, now it's me giving an opinion, I feel like that both positions are right. I think marriage is wonderful. It's, it's something the Lord created. He, he declared it to be good. And I think for most people, they will get married. So if you're a young lady in your youth group <laughs> and you're worried, you'll probably have nothing to worry about. The Lord calls very few people to be celibate like Paul. But when the Lord does call someone like Paul to be celibate, see if that did happen at some point to be you, the Lord will give you the grace so that he'll change your opinion and your feelings and you will think it's better. You notice how Paul thought it was better because the Lord had done something there with him. It was God's part of God's purpose and plan. So Paul felt that what he had was the best thing. But when people are married, what they have is the best thing for them. <laughs> so the Lord does different things with different people. And you just be where the Lord wants you, and it will be the best thing for you. For most people, the Lord had look, the Lord created the sex drive, the Lord desired marriage, the Lord wants children, the Lord wants people to write, have godly families. Like all of this is God's plan and it's all good. Now, the question, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? It's actually there's more in that question than you think. Because some of the people that were asking that question were married. And they're kind of thinking, in my marriage, is it good to not touch my wife? And Paul's saying, no. Let the husband give his wife the affection owed her 
In other words, touch your wife. And let the wife give, you know, let the husband and the wife give it to each other. In other words, be romantic with each other. Be sexual with each other. It's God's design and it's good. <laughs> so it, it's interesting. And you know what else is really fascinating about this chapter? Is that in the Roman world, the, the Roman law and all of that, women were often seen as the property of their husbands. So the man would could touch his wife whenever he wanted, but the wife had no say over the man. This is Roman culture. But Paul writes here, the wife doesn't have her authority over his own body. The husband does. Now that part fits into Roman culture. But he says, likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife. That's a radical idea for the time. And um, in other words, in marriage, you become one and you give yourself to the other person so that your desire is to serve them, please them, love them. And this is actually a picture of Jesus and the church. We learn that from Ephesians chapter five. And the Bible says that marriage is holy, so it belongs to God. So when a marriage is got the right heart, the right attitudes, people are there to serve each other, this is a picture of Jesus. And it's wonderful. And there's no better place for children to grow up in a, in a family like that. So Paul talks a lot about all these things. He says, don't, if you're married to an unbeliever, don't leave them because you will be a blessing to them. But if they leave you, then don't, you know, then stay, you know, let that be. That's fine, but don't leave them. You're going to demonstrate Christ to them in your lifestyle and your manner of living. And if you're married to an unbeliever, you're going to aim to win their heart to the Lord, not win their mind to the Lord. When, you, when, you, um, when you're in a, a relationship, people see you good and you bad. They see the real you. So if the real you is someone that complains and is grumpy and, and, um, and uh, tr always trying to get your own way and, and argumentative and you're demonstrating what a Christian is like. And your partner is not at all going to be interested in following the Lord. But if you're someone who has a heart to try to serve and to love and to give, even if, even if the unbelieving partner isn't giving back, you're showing them what a Christian is really like, even when you don't say anything. And in that way, and combined with your prayers and your words when you get the chance, you will win the heart of the other person that's your goal. Win the heart. <laughs> so it's a great chapter. It's full of many, many wonderful things. And um, it's not to say that being single is, is better than being married or that being married is better than being single. It's what the Lord calls you to. And whatever the Lord calls you to, that is the best thing for you. Lord, I thank you for this chapter. Thank you for Paul's experience of being victorious as a single person. And um, I thank you, there are many people who know what that's like. And um, But Lord, I thank you also for family and marriage and children. And I ask you to strengthen every person listening to my voice today. Strengthen them in the position they're in. Give them grace to serve and love and to walk with Christ. Amen.